You have a bold vision, a God-given dream, a higher calling. At Oral Roberts University, graduate school is more than a degree. We approach education holistically, mind, body, and spirit. Our mission is to develop whole men and whole women, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to reach the world. Don't stop short of your destiny. Learn more today at oru.edu slash grad.
Oh, hallelujah to the name above all names. Hallelujah to Jesus. Oh, the one who makes a way. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Oh, cause your name is power. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. For oh, we believe in Lord and break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. We sing it again. Your name is power. And your name is power. Your name is healing. Your Jesus, oh, we sing it again. We shout Jesus. 
it again, your name is power. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. We believe it, Lord. And break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Jesus, we believe your name is power. We speak it over our lives. We speak it over our families. God, we thank you for your presence in this place and the power that you've given us in your name. In Jesus' name we say, amen. You may be seated as you turn your attention to the screen. Empowered, the dictionary defines it as receiving power and authority, boldness, inspired. At Oral Roberts University, we're raising up a generation of spirit-empowered leaders, men and women from more than 100 nations who are ready to make a difference. And it's working. Forbes has called ORU one of America's top colleges. Princeton Review called it the best in the West. Times Higher Education and the Wall Street Journal ranked ORU 12th in student engagement. The Daily Beast calls ORU one of the top five healthy universities. And the Travel Channel called the ORU campus stunning. So if you're serious about doing something significant with your life, it's time you joined our spirit-empowered global community. Because we're not making little plans, and you shouldn't either. At ORU, we're training whole leaders for the whole world. It's our destiny. It may be yours, too. Today we're continuing our series called War. And today's message is entitled, Attack. Attack. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your presence. Your name, Jesus, is life. I speak it over this student body, this faculty, this staff, over our nation, and over our world. I pray, Jesus, use me today. I really need you. In Jesus' name, amen. The movie clip you saw is from the movie Pearl Harbor. Of course, Pearl Harbor lives in infamy, December 7th, 1941, in a surprise attack by Japanese carriers, planes, bombers, and submarines. 19 ships were lost or damaged in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. At the end of the day, over 2,400 U.S. personnel had died and 68 civilians and hundreds more were injured. In the movie clip we saw, President Delano Roosevelt is encouraging America to strike back. His generals, those around him, said it was not possible, and ultimately, Roosevelt said, it must happen. Don't tell me it's impossible. It took about three months for things to come together, but ultimately, uh, because of the ingenuity of a Navy commander, a submarine commander actually, the, um, a raid was devised called the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid took place on April 18, 1942. The Navy's bombers were small and did not carry much armament, so in order to do this raid, they took 16 B-25 bombers and put them on the deck of the carrier, the Hornet. They sailed out of San Francisco with uh, other boats and um, armament around them, and they were headed toward uh, the area near Japan. They planned on being about 400 miles from Japan, and the carrier turning into the wind and the 16 B-25 bombers from the Hornet going across the island of Japan. The plan was that they would bomb Japan including Tokyo and several cities, Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe, and then fly on to China and land in China. The seas were rough. The Japanese discovered uh, the voyage toward the end, and the weather was bad. And because of that, they had to launch the um, attack 
about seven, 800 miles away from the shores of Japan, meaning that the bombers would run out of fuel before arriving, uh, some of them, on the shores of China. In order to get ready for the mission, they asked volunteers from the 17th Bombardment Group of the Air Force to uh, go on this mission. They told them it would be very, very dangerous and that it would be very hazardous, and many of them would die, and yet 80 volunteers stepped forward and said, we'll be part of this mission. Ultimately, after bombing Japan, you saw on the map, uh, they flew to the shores of China. One plane diverted and flew to Russia. It was captured there and kept until the end of the war. And the other planes tried to make it to China. It was in darkness by the time they arrived, and many of them had to um, crash land. In fact, most of the planes were lost. I think only one plane made it through. And before the day was over, a few of the airmen also lost their lives, and eight were captured by the Japanese. One died of starvation in captivity, three were shot by the firing squad, and four of the American soldiers on the Doolittle Raid uh, survived. One of the survivors in studying for this message, I found this amazing, interesting story, was named Jacob de Chazer. Jacob was one of the crew who bombed Nagoya on the raid, and he was an atheist at the beginning of the war. He was captured. He was one of the four people captured, and for 40 months, he lived in captivity uh, in Japan and then ultimately in China. 34 months of his captivity were in isolation. While he was in captivity, he persuaded one of the Japanese guards to loan him a Bible, a copy of the Bible. And the message in the Bible, though he could only have it for about three months, led to his conversion, and he got saved while in captivity. He started the war as an atheist, went on the Doolittle Raid, and got saved while he was a prisoner of war. After the war, Mr. Deshazar pursued his education and decided to return to Japan in 1948 as a missionary. Deshazar, the Doolittle Raider who bombed Nagoya, ultimately met Captain Mitsuo Fushida. Fushida led the attack on Pearl Harbor. In fact, he was the only person that could break radio silence from the bombardment uh, and the Japanese force and is the person who shouted the famous phrase, Torah, 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 meaning they had been successful. Ultimately, he and De Chazer became good friends. Fushida became a Christian in 1950 after reading a tract written by De Chazer titled, about De Chazer titled, I Was a Prisoner of Japan, and the pilot who led the raid on Pearl Harbor spent the rest of his life as a missionary in Asia and then in the United States. On one occasion, De Chazer, Fushida, preached together as Christian missionaries in Japan. In fact, in 1959, De Chazer moved to Nagoya, the city he bombed on the Doolittle Raid and established a Christian church. Everybody say wow and give God praise. Amazing. (laughs) The Doolittle Raid that emanated from the determination of President Roosevelt and others to turn the tide against Japan at the beginning of the war was deemed a success despite the loss of most of the planes and even of these crew we've talked about. The raid lifted the hopes of the American people and shook the Japanese. Doolittle's team helped turn things around by attacking against all odds. Now I want to say in this message as I begin today, we are living in a spiritual war zone. And I want to call you during this message today to learn to attack in the name of Jesus Christ in the midst of it all. In other words, learn that in the middle of the chaos we are in to commit positive action for the glory of God against our spiritual enemy. Let me say to you, conditions will never be perfect for serving Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozier wrote, The fall of man has created a perpetual crisis. It will last until sin has been put down and Christ reigns over a redeemed and restored world. Until that time, the earth remains a disaster area and its inhabitants live in a state of extraordinary emergency. Then Tozier added, 
statesmen and economists talk hopefully of a return to normal conditions. But conditions have not been normal since the woman saw that the tree was good for food and took of the fruit thereof and did eat. In this kind of emergency, chaotic world that will never be normal, God is calling you to learn how to attack the enemy's kingdom in the name of Jesus. General Anthony McAuliffe was a leader of the 101st Airborne. I'm sort of in World War II and World War I today, but uh, during the Battle of the Bulge of World War II, many of you know the story, the German army, army looked like they were being defeated but had one last thrust. It was the Battle of the Bulge. During this battle, he said this, men, we are surrounded by the enemy. We have the greatest opportunity ever presented an army. We can attack in any direction. Ferdinand Folk, who was the supreme commander of the Allied forces in World War I, at one point during a strong advance from the Axis forces, said this. I love this quote. My center is yielding. My right is retreating. Situation excellent. I am attacking. Now let me declare as I begin this message that Jesus Christ came into a chaotic world to attack our spiritual enemy. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Wow. Jesus didn't come to make a peace treaty with Satan. He came to destroy his work. And then in John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22, just to remind you, Jesus said to those of us who follow him and to those who were gathered there that evening, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Today, we are called to join with Jesus in assaulting darkness and destroying the devil's work. Wherever the enemy is at work, you and I are called to engage him and drive him out. Whether it's sickness, disease, hopelessness, demon possession, religious abuse, sin, death. Jesus came to destroy Satan's work wherever he found it on planet earth. Now let me say to you today, and I think we saw the, an example of this in one of the greatest football games I've ever seen this past weekend between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills. That one of the things you need to learn in your life is that the best defense is a good offense. The last few minutes of that game, basically it was whoever got the ball last was going to win, right? Great offense, amazing offense. And you need to learn spiritually in your life that when you go on the offensive, it helps you defensively as well. In fact, I believe one of the reasons Jesus gave the Great Commission was so you and I could make it against the enemy. He said, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, share the gospel with every person, with every creature, make disciples of all nations. He said, I want you to go aggressively. I want you to take this message of hope to a hopeless world, knowing, knowing that when they did so, the best defense would be a good offense. I told someone yesterday, I, I think it was our president's cabinet, it's really hard to backslide when you're trying to win somebody to Jesus. You can, but when you know you're trying to witness to that person and bring them to Jesus Christ and you're confronting the enemy, it's really hard to mess up. In fact, I find myself praying through more, getting right with God more, knowing I need God's spirit and his energy and his anointing. Jesus knew this, so he sent us against the enemy. He said the gates of hell will not prevail, not because they're going to attack the church, but because the church is going to attack hell and the gates that hold the prisoners bound for hell in are going to give way under an aggressive, anointed, empowered church, and you're going to win the victory. Come on, give God praise. The best defense is a good offense. Well, I want to talk for just a moment today about three people in the Bible who went on the offensive when it looked like the odds were overwhelming. And I want to learn three lessons 
today that I think will help you go on the attack even in the midst of chaos. The first person is Samson. Story is given in Scripture in Judges chapter 15 about Samson. Samson at this point in his life has been tied up with uh, uh, ropes and he's being led to the enemy, to the, to the Philistines. And he, he has the folks with him commit that you won't destroy me, you'll let them take me captive, you won't kill me. Okay, I'll let you take me up there. And so on the way, while he's on the way, the Philistines come against him and they surround him. And at that point, the Holy Spirit comes on Samson, he breaks free from the ropes. He has no weapon in his hand. He has no shield, no sword, no spear, no bow and arrow, anything. But he finds the skeleton of an old donkey laying by. And he grabs the jawbone of that donkey. And he begins to whip the Philistines. And before it is over, I think he kills a thousand men. It says in Judges 15, 15, he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He grabbed hold of it and struck down 1,000 men with the jawbone bone of a donkey. What a weird weapon to use. When it was over, the place that he was on was a small hill. He had slain a thousand Philistines uh, with just the jawbone of a donkey. He cast the jawbone down, uh, and the place was named Ramoth Lehi, which means jawbone hill. Jawbone. You never see this in world history about wars, but Samson won a battle on Jawbone Hill with the donkey of a with the jawbone of a donkey. And then on that hill, after killing a thousand people under the power of the Holy Spirit with a very simplistic weapon, Samson is thirsty. And the very place where he won the victory against the Philistines is a place. Ramoth Lehi, where God opens up a fountain in a low place on that hill and water comes out and Samson is refreshed at the very place where he won the victory with a rudimentary weapon by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen closely. You are all young. Most of you are young in this room or you feel young if you're around college students all the time. Your places of victory now will become your places of refreshing later. The victories you win right now in your life are important because later on they will be places of refreshing for you for many, many years to come. Many of the battles I won at your age spiritually still bless me as I reflect on them even today as an older man. Okay? Number two, second person I want to talk about is Jonathan the son of King Saul. Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Again, the Philistines, a uh, perpetual enemy of Israel, were oppressing the people of God. They, they kept them actually in this moment in 1 Samuel chapter 12 and 13, they kept the Israelites from owning weapons. In fact, it says this in 1 Samuel 13 verse 22, on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. Now here's the Philistines. King Saul is about to go to battle against them with 600 men. And the only people in the army that have a sword or a spear, a weapon, are Saul, the king, and his son Jonathan. Because the Philistines designed it that the only place you could get a weapon sharpened was in the country or the area of the Philistines, so nobody had a weapon. The other people had sticks, they had rocks, they had nets perhaps, but they had no weapon made of metal. And the Philistines were girded with metal weapons and ready to slaughter the Israelites. Two swords in the entire army. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, let's read what happened. So Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you heart and soul. So here they go. 
They climb up between two cliffs that are sharp. It's a very difficult task to get up to where the Philistines are on the high ground above them. And and Jonathan has his sword and the armor bearer probably has a shield to protect his master Jonathan he's working for. They climb up together. They had a signal between them that if the Philistines say, come on up here, we'll go up and take them on. The Philistines say, come on up here, we're going to teach you guys a thing or two. We're going to show you what people with weapons can really do. Saw a Jonathan climbs up with his armor bearer, and in just a few moments, they take on the Philistines, and they slaughter 20 of them with one sword, with one sword. Now, one of the things I want you to learn right here is this. God is able to save by many or by few. Sometimes it's just one person filled with courage and God's word that can turn the tide. Just one person. The armor bearer got inspired by Jonathan's courage. And so he put his sword to work, killed 20 Philistines. Then listen what happens. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 15, then panic struck the whole army, talking of the Philistines, those in the camp and field and those in the outpost and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Hallelujah. When someone is full of courage, when someone stands up and says, yes, it looks terrible, it's horrible, what's going on is chaotic, what's going on is not pleasant, what's going on is not optional, it's not optimal, I mean, it's not optimal, it's not something that we want to do, but in the middle of it, I believe God is calling us to do this, and by the authority of his word and the sword of the spirit, you attack the enemy's kingdom. When you do that, God is going to witness and shake the world for the glory of his name. Yep. Then, of course, Saul and the rest of the army got involved because they risked it all, and God did the rest. Samson, Jonathan, third person I want to mention that turned the tide when odds were against them by attacking was a man by the name of Jehu. Jehu was captain in, a captain in Israel's army. He was minding his business as part of the armed forces. When one day, while he's in his tent, a uh, young uh, prophet breaks into the tent. He's out of breath. He's been sent by the prophet Elisha. He has a horn of oil with him. He runs up to this captain who is minding his business, just a normal captain in the army, it seems, and pours oil on his head, on his head and says to him, God, Jehu, has anointed you to be king of Israel. He had no lineage. He wasn't in the proper line. He wasn't supposed to be king. But when he did that, something happened to Jehu. And Jehu went out to his men and they said, what did that guy say to you? He said, you know those prophets, they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. He told me I was supposed to be king of Israel and poured this oil on me. And they they rolled out their garments. They had their own little coronation ceremony. And his squad anointed him, ordained him, and spoke to him and said, you are the king of Israel. He had no kingdom. He had no throne, but he had an anointing. So he got in his chariot and he rode to the battlefield and he found, uh, in fact, he rode furiously, the scripture says. He had a passion on him. He had something that was burning inside of him. Something was going on in his heart. And when he rode, the two kings, the king of Judah and the king of Israel came out to meet him. One was Ahab's son and one was related to Ahab and Jezebel in Judah. The spread of Ahab and Jezebel's influence had been amazing. For 30 years, they had been empowered. And though Ahab was dead, Jezebel was still alive and evil had permeated both the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And in this moment, Jehu, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, decided to attack. He took down one of the kings, uh, and then he chased the other one until he shot him, wounded him, and he died a little later on. In that moment, two kings came down under the anointed power of a man coming out of nowhere whom God had touched and prophesied to uh, who attacked uh, in the middle of it all. He didn't stop there. He got in his chariot and he rode to Jezreel. I want to read to you what happens when he enters into the, into the city of Jezreel where Jezebel lived. Remember, for 30 years, Jezebel had come from a pagan society and brought Baal worship into Israel. 
And for 30 years, she had been empowered as queen and now as queen mother. She was in power. Her evil reign was, uh, would make you sick at your stomach. Elijah had come against it and not been able to stop it, and God had taken him out. Elisha had come against it, and this far, he had not been able to bring it down. But now, this anointed soldier who decided in the midst and against all odds, even after 30 years of oppression, to attack, was about to do what no one else had done and fulfill the word of God. So let's read what happens. Jehu went to Jezreel, 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. Jezebel heard about it. So she put makeup on her eyes and fixed her hair. She was going to look good for this moment. She was going to put on her power face again. Actually, she was putting on uh, makeup for her death, but she didn't know it. She looked out of a window. Jehu entered the gate below. Then Jezebel said, you're just like Zimri. You murdered your master. You just killed the king. Have you come in here in peace? He looked up at the window and simply said, who's on my side? Who? Who is on my side? Two or three officials looked out the window. And he said to them, throw her down. They'd lived with her for 20, 30 years. They'd been working around this evil for most of their life. And all of a sudden, the anointing on this one man emboldened them. They grabbed Jezebel, painted face, tied up hair and all, looking really pretty, and threw her out of the window. On the way down, she hit the rocks. And by the time she landed on the ground, she was dead. And the power of evil was broken under the anointing of the Holy Spirit spirit I know it's gross I'm sorry throw her down so they threw her down some of her blood splashed on the wall some of it splashed on Jehu's chariot horses as they ran over her Jehu was under the influence of God's presence in the anointing on his life by the way Jehu went in for just a little while and then he sent Uh, people out to bury her and by the time they got there dogs had eaten Jezebel up because Elijah had prophesied that they would do so come on give God praise it may take a while it may take 10 it may take 20 it may take 30 years evil may look like it's going to conquer it may look impossible it may look like it's never going to happen it may look like God's word is never going to come true but at the right moment under the right anointing with the right person who has enough courage to do what God has commanded them God will bring the strongholds down and defeat the devil by his power and for his glory The impossible becomes possible when God's servants are courageous. Jesus brought God's kingdom into a world dominated by darkness for thousands of years. He says this, as you go to his followers, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. He says later on in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter into a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. It was unlikely. The world was in chaos. A man who had been born in a barn, in a manger, who had lived part of his childhood as a refugee in a foreign country, who was raised in obscurity, was under the power and authority and anointing of the Holy Spirit. The religious system of his day and the Roman power in Jerusalem, Galilee, and Judea seemed to make it impossible that Jesus Christ could triumph over evil and over the kingdom of darkness. Satan's kingdom had been established on the earth for thousands of years since the time of the garden. Adam had given over the rule of this planet to darkness. Satan had built his kingdom and built it strongly, and landing on what seemed to be foreign territory and foreign ground was Jesus, the Son of God. And yet in a matter of three years, under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, wherever Jesus found Satan's kingdom built, he tore it down. He healed the sick. 
He raised the dead. He broke the powers of demonic uh, energy. He overthrew the uh, tables of the money changers in the temple. Jesus came to destroy, not to call a, a truce, not to sign a peace treaty with Satan saying, I'll stay in heaven and you can stay in power on earth. He came to invade the enemy's territory, overthrow his kingdom, and bring the kingdom of God to planet earth so that the will of God could be done here as it is in heaven. Wow. Wow. And he calls us to do the same. So let me say to you as students at All Roberts University, after all, things will never be perfect. If you're waiting for the world to settle down, if you're waiting for things to get right, if you're waiting for the pandemic to be over, if you're waiting for the economy to be better, if you're waiting till you get married or waiting till you get this job or waiting till then or waiting till there, you'll be waiting the rest of your life. Things are never going to be perfect, but in the middle of it all, I hear the Holy Spirit. I hear the voice of the leader of heaven saying, nothing is impossible with me. Rise up and attack Satan's kingdom and I'll give you the victory. Wow. We must attack even when the odds are against us. Odds were against the early church, but they went on the offensive. They went and bound the strong man. Let me say today, the demonic is strong because God's church is weak. And he is calling us in the 21st century to move out of the defensive and into the offensive. I want to remind you that God turned Job's situation around when he moved from defensive to offensive. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned his captivity. Some of you have been on the defensive for months, for years, for weeks. It feels like you're swatting flies. The devil's having a heyday with you. It's like bombs are coming in from everywhere and demonic influence is hitting your mind, your spirit, your heart, and you're just playing defense all the time. You say, Dr. Wilson, what do I do? Well, I tell you one thing you can do. You can rise up and say all things are possible with God. Find somebody that's hurting. Find somebody that needs prayer. Find somebody that needs love. Find some situation where Satan is at work and attack his power in the name of Jesus and you'll find that when the enemy comes against you one way, he'll flee before for you seven ways, and God will give you the victory. Man, I feel a power in this room today. I know I'm loud. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not angry. I'm not screaming because I'm angry. I'm screaming because I believe God wants to give us the victory. You become dangerous to Satan's kingdom when you are not afraid any longer. When you're not afraid to die, when you're not afraid any longer, you become dangerous. The Lord gave me this statement. Somebody needs this desperately. Listen closely. You will never hurt the enemy's kingdom as long as you are afraid of being hurt. You'll never hurt Satan as long as you're afraid that he's going to hurt you. Some of us need to get out of the sick bay, out of our sick tent, off of the sidelines and get in the game and risk it all. What do we learn from Jonathan? Use the sword God has given you. One person can turn the tide. What do we learn from Jehu? Be emboldened by the Holy Spirit. Ride your chariot. Move your life under the power of the Holy Spirit. And number three, refresh yourself at your places of victory. Lisa and I have had levels of spiritual warfare in our life that have been unlike uh, most people just because of what God has called us to do over the years. And um, I wanted to tell this story somewhere in this series. I'm going to share it right now because some of you are going through some things and you need to turn things around. Many, many years ago, back in the 1990s, I was launching an initiative in the denomination I was serving. I was International Youth Ministries Director, and I was launching a denomination-wide, youth group-wide, for youth groups all over the world, a thing called Operation Hope. I saw the despair. Youth suicide was really high in the 90s, and I knew we needed to turn the tide and just bring hope to a generation. You can play a little bit. Go ahead. And I was getting ready for our general conference, General Assembly, 
I was on, I think that night, uh, that week I was on Saturday night. It was a big night. Assembly closed the next day, and young people from all over the world were there. And for us, it was a big deal, about 10,000 people, but not necessarily for other groups, but for us, it was big. And I'd been praying about this Operation Hope, and I'd prepared my sermon. It was all about bringing hope to a generation, and we made a declaration of war on the stage against the powers of darkness that were destroying young men and women. And that afternoon, before that evening, I was focusing, I was alone, I was praying about the service that night and how God wanted me to conclude and minister and launch this initiative around the world and the whole denomination. A call came into my office. It was a young lady who was about to commit suicide. She didn't know what I was going to preach that night. She had no idea what I was about to do. And uh, one of my staff got a hold of me and said, Dr. Wilson, or, or Billy at the time, we got somebody that's uh, about to commit suicide. They want to talk to you. I never met this person in my life. I didn't know her. So I got on the phone. Her name was Pam. Pam was in deep depression and about to kill herself. And God helped us, and I talked Pam out of killing herself and went to the pulpit that night knowing we were really on target. This was a, a sign from the devil that confirmed what God was doing, that we were on target with a new generation. But what happened with Pam was very unusual in our life. I, somebody perhaps needs this. I don't know. But for the next several years, when you're under spiritual attack, when you're under spiritual pressure, wherever the weak link is, it will show up. It's like uh, pressure on a foundation. Wherever the weakness is, it'll show up. And for the next several years, 15 years of Lisa's and my marriage, whenever we were under severe spiritual attack or in severe spiritual warfare, Pam would call. Now, she didn't know this. She didn't know that this was happening. But it became a sign for us over and over again. In fact, <laughs> if we weren't under attack, and Pam called, we'd say, what's about to happen? And sure enough, within about a week or two, we were under severe attack. But every time Pam would call, usually it was right in the middle of a severe spiritual attack. For several years, I counseled with her. I tried to help her. She was usually depression. Usually the devil was attacking her. Usually she was really in a weak spot. She lived uh, hundreds of miles away from us, not anywhere near where we lived in Tennessee. Finally, I turned Pam over to Lisa. I said, you'll just have to talk to her. I, I, I mean, I'm under attack when she's calling. I don't need to focus on what I'm doing. I need you to help me with Pam. She never killed herself, thank God. And after a few years, Lisa did an amazing job. Pam got her life straightened out. She got married. She got whole. God touched her. Come on, give God praise. God ministered to her. And since that happened, when we're under spiritual attack, Pam doesn't call anymore. Now, we got another sign going on right now. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's very unusual. Since we've been at ORU and the Lord told me, warned us about it before we came. And so when we're under spiritual attack here, usually one or two things happen. It's pretty amazing. But not Pam. Pam got healed up. When you're under attack, wherever the weak spot is in your life or wherever the weak spot is in your family or in your home or in your mind is going to be vulnerable to the enemy. So how do you turn the tide? I believe, in a spiritual sense, you do what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did that day. You say the way is to attack, to come back at the enemy with the ferocity of faith. That said, I want you to stand to your feet. I know we usually dismiss. Don't move just yet. Just hang with me just one more minute, and then if you need to go, you can. I'll finish this series a week from Friday. It'll be a different kind of message. It'll still be about war. It'll be about the camaraderie of the army. But today, I have felt like as I approach this service, there's a bunch of you that need to turn the tide. You've been playing defense. Satan's been beating you up. And you need to turn things around and become God's instrument of attack against Satan's kingdom. Now, 
I don't know how I'm going to do this, but we're going to do it for just a few minutes. If that's you, and you have been under attack like Job of old, and you want things to turn around, and you want God to help you be an instrument of his kingdom to destroy, that's what it says about Jesus, destroy the works of the devil in your life, the life of your family, the life of your community, and the world at large. You want to be used this way, but to do that, you say, Dr. Wilson, I need things to turn around. I want you to come up here right now. Come on, you need God to turn things around in your life. You're tired of getting beat up. Come on. This is not a salvation altar call. If you need to be saved, come on. This is a Christian altar call. You want to be an instrument that God uses to attack the enemy's kingdom. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, hundreds of you are going to come. Fill in all over there. Fill in all the way down the wall, whatever you need to do. Young lady, you're in this room, and you are tired of what's going on in your mind. You are worn out by these spirits that are attacking your identity and who you are, and you feel like you are in a fog of confusion where there's no hope. It looks impossible. You say, Dr. Wilson, I have been surrounded in this, it seems, for months, maybe even years. It's very disorienting. You can't get your bearings. It's almost like you're uh, turning and turning over it feels like you're in a, a dryer or something it's just turning and turning and turning in your life young lady today God says to you I want to establish you in a fresh way I want you to stop this turmoil and the chaos around you. I want to put your feet on a solid rock. I'm going to bring you out of this miry clay of junk that's been attacking your mind. I'm going to let you see clearly who you are according to my word, and you are going to be strong, you're going to be powerful, and the battle you have been in will become your place of victory, and years from now, this will be a place of refreshment for you, and you will rejoice in what God did for you at ORU in giving you clarity and victory over the devil. Amen! And Amen. Come on, give God praise. Wow. Oh, come on, come on. I don't know who you are, but you need to receive that right now. Woo. Listen, guys, I got to tell you, in my life for 40 years, if I quit when it got tough, if I backed off and went on the defensive when the devil wanted me to, I would never do anything. We wouldn't be building four buildings on this campus. We wouldn't be growing at ORU. We wouldn't be seeing what God wants us to do here. I wouldn't have seen thousands of people saved around the world. I would have just sat back and played defense. But I tell you, if I did so, I would have been robbed of what God could do in my life. And hundreds and thousands of people in the world would not have heard the gospel and been touched by the power of God. Get up off the bench. Get out of sick bay. And come on. God wants to use you. Wow, wow. As Samson of old and Jehu of old, raise your hands. Raise your hands. I'm going to pray for you for just a moment. I'm going to pray the Holy Spirit will come on you and that the sword that is in your hand, you're at Oral Roberts University after all. You're among the privileged on planet Earth. Thousands of young men and women would love to be here where you are. Don't waste this moment. Get the word of God in your mouth and in your heart. Get God's sword in your hand. You may be the only person in your family or your city or your country, but one person can shake the world under the power of the Holy Spirit. So right now, Lord, I pray for the anointing of Jehu on this generation. The evil around us in our world, in America, oh my, but in the world at large is entrenched deeply. Policies, thinking, reinforced it seems by billions of dollars. It seems impossible that the tide could ever turn. <laughs> I declare nothing is impossible with you. And Lord, like Jehu of old, let us ride under the anointing of the Holy Spirit 
unto the Jezebels of our day that have empowered themselves and taken authority over God's people come down and the people of God are set free by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, for the grace of Samson. Sometimes it feels like we only have a jawbone of a donkey. But in the hands of someone that is full of the Holy Spirit, it can do the work of God and bring refreshing. I pray now, Lord, please, please, Holy Spirit, you would teach this generation how to be on the offense so they can be victorious. And Lord, help us to change the world. Amen and amen. This has been a presentation of Oral Roberts University, a world-renowned and fully accredited Christian university with more than 100 undergraduate majors and minors, as well as graduate degrees in business, education, and theology. If you or someone you know is thinking about college but not sure what to expect, then visit us for one of our Quest Leadership events. Join us for this action-packed, fun-filled, spirit-empowered experience at ORU. Visit classes, attend a Golden Eagle sporting event, worship in chapel, and meet new friends. Want to advance your career but can't move to Tulsa? Then ORU has what you need with convenient online undergraduate and graduate degree programs. Don't wait. You can experience ORU's unique whole person approach to learning and graduate empowered to succeed. Visit us today at ORU.edu.